members of the public are advised that our beings are what cast live by the city of Hamlin temporary archived on the city website. Other individuals at the meeting may also be audibly or visually recording the meeting. Madam Clerk, are there any changes to the agenda? Uh, well, um, Mr. Chair, there are two added delegation requests. Added is items 4.3 and 4.4. Um, one from the door up all um, regarding the um, Hushard emergency shelters serving single homeless women, and then the same item, Deirdre Pike and Sarah Mayo from SPRC. Um, in addition, there's also one cancellation. The um, delegation listed, um, 6.1, um, had an illness and will be unable to attend. Thank you for that, Madam Clerk. So I need to uh, move the agenda as amended. Moved by Councillor Eden Johnson, second by Councillor Partridge. All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Any declaration of interest? See none. Approval minutes of previous meeting. Moved by Councillor Deval, second by Councillor Green. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Delegation request 4.1. There's a delegation request for Alfredine Plurt, protecting Canadian children, respecting the protection of children, white while in foster care for a future meeting. Any motion to approve? Moved by Councillor Val, second by Councillor Green. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. 4.2, there is a delegation request for Robert Manley respecting accountability and transparency of access to housing for today's meeting. I need a motion to move. Uh, uh, Councillor Green, second by Councillor Johnson, Aiden Johnson. All those in favor? Carried. Okay. There is a delegation request for Medora Upal Women's Housing and Planning Collaborative respecting pressure at emergency shelters serving single homeless women in Hamilton for today's meeting. Moved by Councillor Parge, second by Councillor Green. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. 4.4, there is a delegation request from Deidre Pike and Sarah Bell, Social Planning Research Council, the Hamilton SPCR, uh, SPRC, respecting... <laughs> Respecting pressure and British shelter serving single women's uh, homeless women in Hamilton. Councilor Partridge, second by Councilor Green, all those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. We now move to consent items 5.1. Is there any discussion on item 5.1? Correspondence from John, Dr. John Beard, Director of the Department of Aging and Life Course World Health Organization, who, respecting the city of Hamilton's induction as a member of the WHO Global Network of Age Friendly Cities and Communities. Council Jackson. Mr. Uh, Chairman, thank you, and I just want to uh, say thank you to Dr. John Beard and your Seniors Advisory Committee was at the forefront, along with city staff, uh, Mark Weingartner, I believe, who is the liaise with WHO, uh, did a terrific job with the application, and this is uh, wonderful, and if uh, you recall at the Grants Committee meeting about 10 days ago, that hopefully will be ratified uh, 48 hours from now at Council. There's a set amount of money as well to help the Council on Aging, to help the City of Hamilton as it's working towards endorsing and doing all the great projects to make us an age-friendly city, and I'm very proud to uh, be your representative with the Seniors Advisory Committee. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Jackson. Council Green. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm just reflecting on this, this letter here, having a great conversation with uh, Dr. Jim Dunn, and you know, he, he brought it to my attention that we're about 12 years away from having the first wave of this, uh, of this boomer population hit 80. So I can only imagine what that's gonna do for our infrastructure, both uh, social, recreational, but also physical infrastructure. So um, 12 years, is, it seems like it might be a long time, but I'm sure it's gonna come fairly quickly when we have this wave of, of, the, of the boomer generation, the first wave that'll carry on for I think another 20 years, as, as he was mentioning. So. I'm hopeful that we can see a time in the city where we're making sure that we're looking through that lens, that age-friendly lens for all of our planning, future planning decisions, as well as things like transit and recreation. So obviously in Ward 3, very fortunate to have the new uh, Bernie Morelli Senior Center coming in, which will kind of speak to this, and certainly thank Council for all their support in, uh, in all the previous count terms of Council. So that's all I got for you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Green. So at this point, I entertain a motion uh, to receive item 5.1. Moved by Councillor Jackson, second by Councillor Green. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Is there any discussions on 5.2 A and B, Minutes of Tenant Advisory Committee? We have a motion to receive A and B. Moved by Councillor Aidan Johnson, second by Councillor Judy Partridge. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. 5.3, is there any discussion on item 5.3 A and B?
Moved by Councillor Jackson, seconded by Councillor Green. All those in favour? Any opposed? Carried. 5.4. Is there any discussion on item 5.4, 2015 Budget Submission, Seniors Advisory Committee? Moved by Councillor Jackson, seconded by Councillor Partridge. All those in favour? Any opposed? Carried. 5.5. Is there any discussion on item 5.5, establishing a, of a revolving loan fund reserve account for the Ontario Renovates Program? Councillor Jackson. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, the uh, recommendation here is, I guess, to set up a, a reserve uh, account, and I believe the background information shows only about uh, $13,000 left at this time, and we get provincial federal funding through this uh, renovation program. And my understanding is this is the type of program that uh, helps um, those um, in a certain low income level, whatever the threshold is, that want to stay in their homes, that might be able to get some loan money at a discounted rate to help do some renovations. So my question through you to Jillian, Jillian Henry, uh, would be Jillian, um, is there a waiting list currently uh, across the city for people who are applying for this uh, program? Mr. Chairman, through you to Jillian, please. Through the chair, uh, yes, there is a waiting list for funding for the Ontario Renovates program. What we do is we continue to take applications as they come in, but there is a set amount that's available through our investment in affordable housing each year, and we can't exceed that amount, which is about $1.5 million a year. So, Jillian, any idea, and I may have uh, caught you off guard, thank you for that answer. Any idea uh, roughly how, how many are on the waiting list currently through you, Mr. Chairman? Just even a range, roughly? Through the Chair, I'm sorry, Councillor Jackson, but I don't have that information, but I can certainly get it to you. Okay, that'd be great. And so it's part of overall a $1.5 million program. I know, Jillian, in the past, Mr. Chairman, I have, um, working through you and your great staff, primarily a Dave Brodati, um, I forwarded on some uh, seniors, uh, especially those that are widow widowers that don't want to be institutionalized, want to stay in their homes till the good Lord takes them home. And I, I have found from time to time I've run into either um, a financial roadblock based on your cap every year and or through some administrative application uh, difficulties uh, for the seniors who uh, have applied and then have often called my office to assist them. And when I've called uh, Dave and, and staff, they've been, uh, they've been very helpful that way. So can you explain to me, is there a legal cap on the amount of money that you can distribute every year, or is that an internal policy matter? Mr. Chairman, through you to Jillian for an explanation, please. Chair, um, <clears throat> when we get the investment in affordable housing, we develop a plan, and the investment in affordable housing program is broken down into four areas. Ontario Renovates is one of them. There's also housing allowances and um, home um, affordable home ownership, and lastly, the development of new affordable housing in Hamilton. And so what we do is we develop a plan, and we present that plan to council so that... Um, <clears throat> the funding is divided up four ways. Okay, um, so staying with the Ontario Renovates, Jillian, um, and you'll find out roughly how many are on the waiting list. So for the sake of argument here, hypothetically, if you had 50 uh, individual locations across the city on the waiting list, you would, put, you would only have funding, let's say, for 10 of those 50 in a given year? Mr. Chairman, through to Jillian, just help me further understand that, please. It really depends upon the amount of funding that the person requires. There is a ceiling, um, and I'm sorry I don't have that information in front of me right now, but I'd be happy to get it to you. So there is a maximum amount that each household can get, and it's based on the requirements that they have in their own home, the repairs that they require in their own home, of course. And also there is a disabled um, portion of that as well for people to get retrofit due to uh, disabilities. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I don't want to um, monopolize the time here, but um, I guess, again, Jillian, I've just, um, the difficulty and a little bit of frustration I've had is that when I've had um, a particular constituent in need who has qualified and your staff have been very helpful and then your staff have said, all the money's used up this year, Councillor, we'll have to wait for next year. If we get some more funding, you might have to wait years down the road. If we get more funding, of course, 
many of my constituents that are applying, Mr. Chairman, are at that age where a few more years down the road, you know, if they're blessed, uh, may be there, may not be there. So maybe, Jill, Mr. Chairman, can we just maybe, Jillian, um, possibly have a, a little more of a thorough report back on your waiting list, uh, how the dollars are distributed each year, who can qualify, who doesn't. Is that, Mr. Chairman, through to Jillian, with your concurrence, Mr. Chairman, yeah, think, is that possible, Jillian, please? I think I heard uh, Jillian already say there's no problem to bring that information back. Okay. And just remind uh, my uh, our count good counselor, it is an Ontario program. All we do is administrate that program. Right. Okay, but our, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, but I believe our staff are the ones who go through the paperwork and the process, and then afterwards, they're the ones who say that, look, counselor, there's no money left, or, uh, you know, uh, the money has been already earmarked, and so I'm just trying to understand if there's a waiting list indefinitely, I'm trying to address the waiting list, Mr. Chairman. Through you to Jillian for a comment. Through the chair, uh, we'd be happy to do a report. We could even do it through an email, um, should you uh, prefer, uh, telling you, um, explaining to you the amount that was allocated in 2014, our eligibility criteria, as well as um, where we are in uh, 2015. Mr. Chairman, if, if it becomes a, a motion from this committee politically, if where you're going is to ask the province for additional funds, to address and accelerate the waiting list, I'm on for that. But either I can ref refer this report back to have it, um, to have more information added, or we can do the email. I'll leave it to my C colleagues. Could I suggest? But uh, I just don't want to lose track yeah, of no, this. No, I think uh, you raise a, a very interesting point because uh, one Thanks, of the things we Julie. do is advocate. Uh, if we have the means, uh, that's what we're here for. We can ask uh, Jillian to actually bring that report back here. I would prefer it that way. That way, we can have a discussion uh, and actually have viewers uh, participate in through delegation or through uh, just watching on stream uh, the discussions taking place and and hopefully. Uh, come up with a resolution or a motion at that point. Mr. Chairman, I'll take your direction. I really appreciate that, pending my colleagues' comments. Thank you, Jillian. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just wondering, and I'm curious, um, although this one is administrated outside of, uh, of the city, how, how does this compare to programs that have been um, so eloquently written about in our policy for the Homelessness and Housing Action Strategy Plan? Are there comparable programs and are there comparable funding models that we might have of a better direct uh, access to? Um, certainly the um, renovation and retrofit of houses for low-income households is considered a priority in the Housing and Homelessness Action Plan. Um, this program was previously called RAP. We, um, and uh, it is the only program of this sort in Hamilton that offers a forgivable loan for household repairs for low-income households. Although there is another program, um, I'm not sure if it still um, is in operation, through the Neighbourhood Action um, Strategy as well. So just, just for clarity, Mr. Chair, through you to, to Ms. Hendries, is, so is this the program that is referred to? I think it might be 4.1 in the action strategy. That is that, or is there another program that's written about in the, in the um, Homelessness and Housing Action Strategy Plan? We were certainly referring to this as being one of the targets in the Housing and Homelessness Action Plan to increase the funding so that we could increase the amount of household repairs and people who are able to stay in their own homes. And I, and I say that, Mr. Chair, because I think some of the confusion which, is, uh, which has been relayed and communicated to me in the community is that when we have the conversation about this beautiful plan that we have, the disconnect is often in how we're able to fund it. And so uh, I'm certainly in support of anything that uh, counselor, my good counselor colleague Jackson has that would advocate for increased funding, acknowledging the, the gaps, Mr. Chair, uh, in that continuum between owning a home and, you know, being in a precarious situation. So. Uh, I think something that is incumbent on us to certainly highlight and perhaps better advocate for uh, with, with that regard to make sure that people who are one mortgage payment or one leaky roof away from, you know, from, uh, from being precarious are, are better supported, be they seniors or, or just low income, you know, working folks who are trying to get by. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful to see some real dollars go behind these beautiful policies that we have in place. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any further comments? Uh, seeing none. Uh, I 
would ask Councillor Jax at this point to move that, make it formal by moving the motion to have that report come back here. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, if you want, Jillian, this, uh, your recommendation today is basically just to acknowledge setting up a reserve account, correct? I'm happy to move that to get that adopted, Mr. Chairman, with the follow-up report to come back to committee. Everything Jillian understands what we need. How's that, Mr. Chairman? Okay, so we'll formalize the bringing back uh, the statistical yes. information in regards to waiting list and times, And, and dollars cetera. available. And Thank dollars. you. I'll Thank move you. that seconded by Councillor Green. Thank Madam you. Madam Clerk, do you have all that? Back by Councillor Green. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favour? Any opposed? Carried. And I'll move 5.5 then to set up the reserve account. Moved by Councillor Jackson, second by Councillor Green to set up the reserve account. All those in favour? Yeah. Any opposed? Carried. 5.6. Uh, Is there any discussion on item 5.6, Social Housing Capital Reserve Fund, City Housing of Hamilton, 405 York Boulevard? Moved by Councillor Green, second by Councillor Devell. All those in favour? Any opposed? Carried. 5.7. Is there any discussion on item 57, Neighborhood Action Strategy, Small Grants Funding? Councillor Green. Just looking at the wards affected 2 and 8, if they just want to maybe have staff expand on that a little bit, just uh, for the folks that are following along in terms of that need there. Susan? Yep. Through you, Chair, I'd just like to clarify that the other uh, neighbourhoods already have that funding through the Hamilton Community Foundation, so the neighbourhoods that we're recommending are in those wards that uh, currently don't have funding. Happy to move it at the appropriate time, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Moved by Councillor Green, second by Councillor Partridge. All those in favour? Any opposed? Carried. 5-8, uh, is there any discussion on item 5-8, Community Heat Response Plan? Moved by Councillor Green, second by Councillor Devell. To receive. All those in favour? Any opposed? Carried. 5-8, we're at the public hearings and delegations component. We did have the cancellation uh, with Mr. Francesco. Um, so currently, item 6.2 is a delegation from Robert Manley respecting transparency and accountability of access to housing. So is Mr. Manley in the house? Come on up. Up, up here, yes. This mic right here. Hello, Your Honours. I wasn't sure if it was Mr. Mayor or not. Um, my name is Robert Manley, and the purpose of this presentation is to demonstrate that access to housing is, um, is not accountable or, and is uh, not transparent. Access to housing makes filing errors, does not follow procedures, and is uh, surrounded by a shroud of secrecy. Uh, background. My career is being a computer programmer, and I have been, sorry, sorry to read in here, forced into an early retirement due to disability. I'm mentioning this to demonstrate that I'm able to distinguish the difference between <coughs> anomalies and statistically significant events. During this presentation, I will mention transitions to homes, which is part of Wesley Urban Ministries. At no time am I saying anything against them. They continue to provide me with food, shelter, and recreation. They have also supplied me with application assistance for both disability and access to housing. TLH will only be mentioned to define my homeless status, um, proof of proper filing of access to housing paperwork, um, and I made a mistake here, I suppose I only did it once because ATH and TDH are so close. Uh, TDH does keep these on file and has faxing proofs of, these pa of this paperwork. And to show that this, uh, and I'm also mentioning them to show that the secrecy is even um, continues to be in place with councillors who are there to advise us and help us, uh, they, they, they are unaware of a lot of the rules and uh, the way that access to housing is handled. Um, I am defined as homeless. I live in, a, in um, transitional housing under access to housing guidelines. This qualifies me as homeless, giving me the same priority to rent geared to income housing as a person living in a shelter or on a street. There is good reason for this, as these homes consist of four units where people have been taken out of shelters and placed together, 
as would be expected, um, hard drug usage, hygiene, bed bugs, and a heavy flow of traffic are among the ongoing issues. This is not a, this is not a complaint, but an explanation of the designation of my homeless status. Original events of discontention. I applied to access to housing in April of 2003 as homeless. These forms were completed and faxed with the aid of a transitional homes worker. During the application process, I encouraged at least five others to, uh, that were co-residents with me at the Salvation Army to apply as well. When I applied for disability, I was asked to fill out forms for ATH to state my disability status, as this would increase my likelihood of obtaining housing. I received transitional temporary housing in June of 2013. At this time, my ATH worker faxed um, ATH, I need to get these wrong, um, requested paperwork for my new address. This pa paperwork was mailed to my new address by ADH. With this, within six months, the people that applied with me had received permanent residences, with four of the five receiving addresses to which I had applied. When a year of their application date, roughly the same as mine, both of the tenants of my transitional home had received permanent housing. Again, I had applied to these addresses as well. I asked, uh, I, I visited Access to Housing in August to see why things were moving so slowly, and they showed my file as inactive and that I was living at the Salvation Army. My file was closed as I did not return forms mailed to the Salvation Army. ATH had sent forms to my new address, and, and, and sorry, my new address since then. They knew my worker was Monica Hynek and showed that I was receiving rent geared to income for transitional homing at my new address. I stated that this was ridiculous and the front desk staff shrugged their shoulders and said, I guess you fell through the cracks. I, I said, this is, um, sorry, this is a gross paperwork error which does not even make sense. They did backdate my file. I made an appointment with a transition to home manager to get a better understanding of what was going on. When I explained the discharging my file, she explained, oh, you fall through the cracks. I have heard this exp expression so many times that it is obviously an ongoing is issue. Councillors will agree with me that they see inconsistencies in the wait list uh, of accessing the housing, but they will not, are not willing to admit this in front of their peers. When I inquired as to the prioritization of the selection process, application date versus disabilities, workers could not give me an answer. So in November 2015, I approached City Hall. I was granted a meeting at the council chambers with my alderman, T to H and ADH. This meeting was in regard to grievances I'd filed with alderman in regard to A to H procedures. The access housing manager did not show up. This is to show lack of accountability and transparency. When I inquired why, the city manager said that they thought it was a problem with T to H. I asked many questions and every question was answered by the housing managers I will have to look this into this and get back to you. Why would the housing manager not be aware of these procedures? Who discusses the terms of their contractual obligation to the city? The one thing they did answer is that the other people that acquired residences ahead of me did so because of mental issues escalating their priority. This is not true and is an important part of this presentation. I received a follow-up letter that stated the waiting list is long. This in no way reflects any of the many questions that I asked during our interview. I then returned to ADH office and inquired about the nature of my status. They showed me as applying to two addresses with one bedroom only. I had applied to about seven addresses with one bedroom and bachelor apartments. Again, if I did not follow up, revealing another paperwork error, I would have been waiting forever on an error prone system. January 2015 meeting. I then recontacted City Hall and asked to present to the mayor of the problems. I was granted a second meeting to see, but um, they, I agreed to have a second meeting with housing to see if these problems could be resolved. When I showed up again, no one was present from ATH. Therefore, nothing concrete could be established. At this time, they told me that only battered men and women were given any priority over homeless when previously I'd been told that it's disability, it's not disability, it's mental disability. Um, okay. This does not make any sense, as we are asked to apply for this. This also contributes to lack of transparency, including professionals with the industry. 
During this meeting, I quoted the ATH website that says one in five applicants are given homeless priority during the selection process. They said no, it was one in ten. Again, this is established as poor paperwork and the lack of, of following documented procedures. I also asked which units at, at um, are seniors 55 and which are 60 and I not, have not received an answer to date. So I went on the internet yesterday and looked that up to see what I could find and I was told that at 55 Park or 155 Park there are units for people that are 55 uh, bachelors only. I asked to apply to those and was refused because I wasn't 60. This is another example of the paperwork being wrong. Um, okay. um, I did ask, and they said, they said it would be repaired, that there was no process, there was no markings on the forms for application for homeless housing to indicate that they were senior. The online one has it, but not the offline. Well, someone could go in and fill out for all those addresses, not be a senior, and never get a place. Again, falling through this, this lack of proper paperwork. Um, so during this meeting in January 2015, I was told I was 80 of 7,000 applicants. It has been almost six months since then, and 80 people have not come up. I should read this properly, sorry. Um, okay, the magic hat theory of access to housing placement can easily be, oh, sorry, you're right from where I have it, I'm sorry. During my tier wait, I have seen homeless people get placement within weeks. I am privy to this information due to where I live and eat. The magic hat theory of access to housing's placement can easily be proven by looking at the monthly variance in the application dates of the homeless that have received housing. These dates could also be compared to my two plus year wait period. I was numbered 80 of 7,000 in rent geared to income applicants. Six, roughly six months have gone since then, so that would mean less than 15 people are housed a month. With 7,000 people on the leading list, it will take 40 years to house these people. Therefore, the application process and work done by access to housing, millions of dollars a year, as of no value to taxpayers, as a 40-year wait, wait list is already in place. If the information I was given in regard to these numbers is wrong, then the, the implications are even further reaching. There is one last, more likely scenario, that the work is so errorful that, that they should not be tendered for further contractual hire. I find that ATH's refusal to show any interest in my situation is a flagrant act of inaccountability. They do as they please and do not suffer any consequences associated um, with their lack of concern for their clients. And the most important aspect of quality is say what you do and do what you say. And uh, if anyone needs any further documentation or copies of emails I've made, I did include my email address on that. Appreciate it. Any questions? Seeing none, I'm going to ask Councillor Green to take the chair for a moment. I do have. Uh, okay, Councillor Green, go ahead. I'm very thirsty. Oh, is this for me? Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Manley, please. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, uh, sorry, through you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Manley, I, I don't really have so much of a question as it seems you've certainly laid out your, your, your case very passionately, and I just wanted to, you know, say that um, I certainly uh, feel terrible for what you're going through. I uh, just wanted to empathize with you on that human level and say it takes a lot of courage to come here and, and present your case and certainly a long challenge and um, as a new counselor, something I certainly don't have the experience or knowledge to, to delve into, but I'm hopeful that uh, we can have some, some clarity brought by staff based on this presentation to find out that if there are these errors in paperwork or these gaps in service that we work diligently to find a way to, to solve that. So just know that from your presentation today, hopefully, uh, not only are you helping yourself, but you're helping people down the line as well. So no, that's my intent. Because of where I eat and live, I'm in, in, in touch with a lot of people, and I know what's going on. And they're very thankful of me being here as well. I'm used to making a lot of money, but I've got bad problems. Um, I have been through addiction, and I do live in a house of addicts. And it's okay. I'm not going to use it again. But this is not mentally healthy for anybody, you know. But through you, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to make that note on a very personal level that I certainly appreciate you coming here and sharing some of this stuff that, uh, that I, I wasn't aware of and I'm sure other members of council weren't aware of and I'm sure staff uh, will have some answers for and hopefully, uh, hopefully we can find some better supports, okay? So hey, thank just, you. Through you, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to make that uh, on thank the public you. record. So, Councilor Green, I'm going to ask you to take the chair for a moment. And uh, my commitment, Mr. Manley, to you is uh, I will set up a meeting with appropriate staff um, and myself and yourself, and we will go through some of the very issues you talked about here today, 
And uh, hopefully if there's improvements that need to be made, we'll make those improvements. If there in fact is uh, reasonable explanations, we'll have those explanations. But my commitment is to you is to sit down and uh, walk through this whole thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and I would be thankful to what, the main thing I am looking for. Of course, I want a place to live. Who doesn't? Is to see a procedure put in place where people can understand where they stand instead of just sitting back and hoping and praying and not knowing where their file sits. That's so, the problem. So, as a, as a chair uh, and as a, an individual that's been an advocate for a very long time, representing uh, workers uh, and people that. Uh, can't represent themselves, I plan to sit there and do as best I can to represent the issues you've raised and ensure that you've been treated fairly. And if there are uh, bugs in the system, so to speak, that uh, we make the proper uh, steps to correct those things so other people aren't impacted uh, on a go forward basis. So once again, thank you for coming in. Yeah, thank you all, your honors. Thank you. Have a thank good you. Day. Thank you. Motion moved uh, by uh, Councillor Green, second by Councillor Johnson. All those in favour? Any opposed? Carried. And I did like that's a direction to staff uh, uh, that uh, we can coordinate with my office to uh, set this up with Mr. Manley. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Joanne. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, on the, at the June the 22nd committee meeting, uh, Jillian and her team are actually bringing forward a report on the access to housing uh, wait list with some uh, recommendations in terms of moving forward with that particular uh, piece right. of work. So there'll be some information in that report as well in terms of perhaps some issues that we're seeing and some progress that we can make. Perfect. Councillor Green? Mr. Chair, just maybe uh, while, while Mr. Manley settling in there, sir, I'm not sure if you caught that, but at our next meeting, um, they're going to be bringing back a report, maybe through you, Mr. Chair, it might be good if you're able to come back uh, as well for that. Thank you. So we move on to 6.3, delegation from Medora, Upol, Women's Housing and Planning Collaborative, respecting pressure of emergency shelters serving single homeless women in Hamilton. How are you, you today? Mr. Chair. Good, good. How are you? Good. Good. So on behalf of the Women's Housing Planning Collaborative, I want to say thank you to you for your ongoing commitment as a city to the crisis of women's homelessness in our community. We um, continue to address the crisis and over the uh, last investment made by the city, uh, we were able to serve a number of women who previously wouldn't, we wouldn't have been able to serve who have come to our doors. As an emergency response, Mary's Place added uh, 10 additional beds to the shelter. And we had support from four Violence Against Women shelters and transitional and second stage housing providers to help deal with this crisis. So that by the end of 2014, we've seen real success beyond just emergency shelter for women in this community. We've housed 154 women access, uh, who have now accessed permanent housing and supports through um, the investment the city has made. <coughs> by working together as agencies, we've been nimble, adaptable, and collaborative, prior prioritizing women's safety above all el else, regardless of the limited resources we're working with. In the coming months, the women's homelessness response system will be severely diminished because of changes happening in the landscape that are facing transitional and second stage services. Of the 154 housed women, 81% of the success stories are from women who've, uh, who've entered and discharged from transitional housing in our community. This kind of success won't continue over the next year unless something else is done. Over the last five months, the future of these programs of transitional housing and second stage services has been challenged by funding cuts, and we're only starting to see the implications. Earlier this year, we heard from Phoenix Place, a second stage program with five units for women and children, that they were at risk of closing. Thankfully, through private donations, the program is now able to stay open. The story isn't so bright for honoring the circle, who will begin closing its doors in June and will displace about 15 families who are living there. There's 45 beds for women and children at honoring the circle, so the closure of this program is very significant for our community. And although YWCA has seen an investment in our transitional beds and programs, 
A reduction in funding from the city this year means we're going to be cutting services from two staff on duty to one staff on duty m most hours of the day. So in response to today's recommendation from the city, staff, we support um, the addition of temporary shelter beds and case management services. And we think that this is a step forward in the right direction. Many of the strides we have made in responding to the crisis have been a result of the investment in our existing assets that enabled us to help women obtain permanent housing without building more shelters or building more supports or building more capital in the city. However, new cuts in funding will now undermine this work and put us steps back in dealing with this crisis. Despite the changing landscape, our women's collaborative will continue to work together to strategize and serve the most vulnerable women in our community. We'll continue to work with the city. We'll continue to work with our provincial and federal funders who also come to the table to work directly with us. And we'll try to find an effective response to ending women's homelessness. In our report, uh, written by uh, SPRC on our behalf, in the short term, WIPIC has recommended the addition of emergency shelter beds with supports, adequate staff supports for women in shelter and transitional housing, and the maintenance of funding for transitional housing. So the staff report today supports some of these recommendations, but not all of them. To really make change in the landscape, we need the city's support of not only today's re recommendations, but further investment and an increased commitment to this issue of women's homelessness in our city. Thank you very much. It's a very uh, in, important issue. And I also uh, appreciate that sometimes we don't need to invest more capital uh, to address the, the uh, immediate need of uh, shelters uh, for women in the community. Uh, so I have a couple of uh, uh, questions. So I'm fully supportive of what's before us here today. I'm hearing that you are as well. Yes. Uh, in addition to what's here, you're also requesting us to consider um, a, f a larger uh, funding envelope to, to create more shelter space, is that correct? It's not to create more shelter space, to cr support the existing transitional housing that's in our city right now. Okay, uh, I'm glad you mentioned, because I just received a, an email this morning from mm -hmm. the Native uh, Urban... Um, Native Women's Center. Thank sent you. Sent email to all of us, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. And it's a transitional... Uh, uh, women's shelter, I understand? It's a transitional housing program, yes. Okay, so uh, my question to you then is, this is one step in, in doing the immediate needs and providing shelter. Um, is it your position that um, we don't have enough women transitional beds funded in this community? It's not a question of having more transitional beds, it's supporting what's already there. We think when we close the doors to honoring the circle, we will be in very desperate, dire circumstances. And, and the other piece of it is key, investing, and we never really fully, as a city, invested in the transitional housing models that we have, as well as the shelter system. So we see the movement and the support in the shelter system and increasing supports that's recommended by the city with the case management supports as a good step forward. I appreciate that, yeah. and it was timely because I received that uh, yeah. email this morning, so thank you. You're welcome. I take uh, the chair back, Councilor Green. Councilor Perch. Actually, my question is for staff, so I'll, uh, thank you for your presentation, welcome. so I'll wait until uh, I can Sure, so Councilor Green, do you have a question for the pre presenter? No, it relates to the presentation. So you got a question of staff? Okay, so could we, is there any questions uh, for the presenter? Seeing none, could I have a motion to receive? Moved by Councillor Green, second by Councillor Aidan Johnson. All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank, Thank you very much for uh, being so frank and coming up here and informing us. Uh, so, Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Councillor Green for, uh, for that as well. Uh, my question through you to, uh, I, probably to Gillian. Gillian, um, this, uh, funding of transitional um, housing has, has been an issue, and my understanding is it is particularly this year. Uh, I know myself personally, I am working with Phoenix Place, and um, you know, which also provides transitional housing, but also support uh, counseling and, and programming to women who are, who are in the, uh, the shelter system. But my question uh, through you, Chair, to Jillian is, has something happened 
uh, to affect the funding? Because, you know, this has been, I think particularly this year, has been a challenge. If you could just elaborate on that, please. There, there, um, the, there has something that's happened, and that is the call for application that we did for federal homelessness funding as well as for community homelessness prevention initiative funding. And we did that call for application at the end of last year. Um, and um, things are, I would say, probably coming to a head because funding for some areas ended March 31st, 2015. So there has been a change in the direction of the federal government as far as the homelessness partnering funding goes and that the change is to a Housing First program. And so what Housing First is, is that um, women, um, men and children should be rehoused as rapidly as possible from emergency shelter into permanent housing and then they would receive the intensive case management supports that they require. So as a result, when there was the call for applications, um, the women's um, homelessness um, services uh, did do a joint application and uh, got funding for a program called Supporting Our Sisters. And Supporting Our Sisters is an intensive case management program, Housing First program. On top of that, there were three other Housing First programs, another for youth, another for the Aboriginal community, and another for men. So as a result, some of the funding has shifted and changing. But the federal government was very clear that we cannot fund transitional housing with federal homelessness dollars. So the city of Hamilton does indeed fund transitional housing through the YWCA program, but not for honoring the circle. All right, and thank you for that. It was the last, the last bit of your explanation that I think is particularly important. And perhaps as a city, we, we've not necessarily done uh, uh, as best a job as we could to explain that. But it was actually the criteria has changed, and that is from the federal government. So they changed the criteria on the funding um, that would be appropriate for more getting into permanent housing as opposed to transitional housing. And if I'm understanding you correctly through you, Chair, that is what has resulted in some of the programs coming to an end in terms of funding as of March 31st, I believe was the date that you gave. But, um, you know, regardless, that doesn't help the situation. We're, st we're, we're still in need of funding transitional housing. But I think the explanation that is really key here is that the criteria for the funding has changed dramatically and it no longer applies to transitional funding. So are we looking at, uh, through you, Chair, possibilities of filling that stop gap? Uh, you know, are there, are there other um, provincial programs or uh, other ways that we can address that through you? Through the chair, are you referring to the um, Honoring the Circle program or, or in general about transitional housing? In general, because, you know, I, I've, I've heard myself from, uh, from places that offer transitional housing that, you know, one of the reasons that they haven't applied for the funding is because there is no, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not sustainable. And so it can be canceled at any time. The criteria can change, which is exactly what happened here. I believe it's three-year funding, the criteria changes, and then you're scrambling, uh, trying to find a way to continue your program. So just, just in general, please. Through the chair, just to clarify, Honoring the Circle did receive some Aboriginal stream um, homelessness partnering strategy funding, and it was a very small amount. Um, it was $55,000 for a residential worker and then some capital costs. But it was a decision with the Aboriginal stream to invest almost all of their funding in the Aboriginal Housing First program. So I would say that there is certainly um, a plan that um, there would be a reduced dependence on transitional housing and a greater increase in people being um, rapidly rehoused from emergency shelter into permanent housing with the supports that they require.
At this point in time, we do not have the ability to allocate any additional funding from the federal homelessness funding into transitional housing or any type of housing because that funding has been allocated now for the next four years. The Community Homelessness Partnering Initiative, which is the other 100% provincial funding that we would allocate, the call for applications is complete for that too. So we do not have any additional funding for that purpose at this time. The only other thing that I would recommend is advocacy to the provincial government to increase our funding for homelessness programs and potentially um, other programs through grants and um, foundations. Thank you for that, Jillian. Um, you know, it, the transitional housing programs are just so fundamental, fundamentally important. Um, to, to uh, I mean, they're, you know, they're, all the programs are important on different levels, but for the transitional ho housing, for uh, whether it's a woman or a man to, to come into some temporary housing, it's not just providing the room, it's the services that go with that. It's that wraparound, that helping them, um, you know, the nurturing, if there's mental health issues, just, just, just being able to give them time to transition. And um, you know, I I don't know what the answer is, and I'm and I'm hearing for you, from you that we don't necessarily have the uh, the authority even. But on the other hand, it, it is something that needs to be addressed. Uh, you know, I, I and and I hear what you're saying about advocating to the province uh, and to the federal government. But uh, I would I would really hate to see the community let this drop because it is just so very important. Thank you. Councillor Green. Thank you very much, and um, certainly Councillor Partridge touched on a, a few of the points that I wanted to raise, but I think through you, Mr. Chair, I heard that there would be systems, adequate systems in place to ensure for the rapid housing of people uh, from, let's say, for instance, honoring the circle. How confident are we in this, in this carryover? We've heard already from, from Mr. Manley some of, the, some of the challenges that sometimes happen. How confident are we, Mr. Chair, uh, to staff that, um, that we make sure that nobody uh, gets left behind in these gaps? To any staff that wants to. Um, uh, through the chair, we're certainly working with all the various agencies uh, that have received funding to deliver the Housing First programs. We have a strong history of Housing First um, in the city with the Transitions to Homes program and the SOS, the Supporting Our Sisters program. But we're certainly going to have to monitor it very closely to ensure that it is delivering the services that we hope it will. And, and, and I can say this, Mr. Chair, because um, even having privy to all the reports, especially when we get into situations, particularly around First Nations, where there's multiple levels of funding and a bunch of different envelopes, uh, I, I get lost a little bit, Mr. Chair. I, I, you know, I thought this, this was an organization that was well situated and, and, uh, and doing great work. So you know, to hear that, that the funding's cut there is, is, uh, is interesting and not knowing all the nuance of the different levels of government. It, are, will there be uh, supports in place for the organization to be able to to navigate um, these different different shifts in funding because, Mr. Chair, I can tell you that the cuts, or the, I should say the, the changing parameters that came to this strategy, uh, we're now seeing in other budget asks and other places, and you think to the enrichment and other places where uh, the transition may or may not be going as smoothly as planned. So something as critical as housing, Mr. Chair, um, you know, I'm hopeful that uh, we're giving full supports to organizations that May may be um, you know on the on the uh, on the poor end of this uh, transition. So uh, I'm, I'm wondering what the comment is in terms of additional supports that those who may may not have made the cut. Go ahead. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, Julian will probably will have a comment as well. But uh, Councillor Green, we were just being asked uh, in terms of the province's new long-term affordable housing strategy for con they're con consulting on that piece of work. We're bringing a report forward to June the 22nd committee meeting in terms of Council's response to that uh, request for information. One of the things that we're making clear in that report is that we don't disagree with the Housing First approach, but by signaling singling that out, there's many other good programs in the community that are discontinued from funding uh, trusteeship programs, transition mm -hmm. to home, whatever it is. 
that there's, and there's just simply not enough money in the system uh, to fund what's necessary, but they certainly, through that decision, have eliminated many other very valuable um, programs in the community. And just to be clear, um, that when Julian answered about the uh, Aboriginal strategy, the Aboriginal community made their own decisions in terms of how the federal homelessness money was to be spent. We didn't make those decisions so about honouring the circle. I think that's an important piece of information um, to Pass the mic over to Julian. Actually, that, that suffices. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think this is part of the challenge, just echoing Councillor Partridge. I know when we went through this the last time, we pick up the spectator and we see, you know, the city of Hamilton's cutting uh, funding to or you know, six, six different agencies. And, and I think the story that's not being told, and I think where a lot of the advocacy gets lost in terms of different levels of government, it's appropriate my counselor colleague uh, Marula is here as I say as I speak to this because it really does get lost when when we have downloading or we have these shifts that really are the responsibility of the province I, th I think we need to get way out and in front of it mr. chair and, and as a community really highlight where um, and, and who is getting hurt most by these policy decisions so that the residents here don't think that it's a decision here at council or, or here through our staff that are causing the hardships of the residents here in Hamilton. So uh, I certainly appreciate the clarity on that. It's important for the viewers to know. It's important for the public to know that a lot of these decisions are out of our hands. And when it comes to this table, it's really just a matter of us managing what's already been decided. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Deville. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and through you to uh, Jillian. <clears throat> Jillian, uh, thank you very much for the phone call we had prior to this meeting on the uh, honoring the circle. But I, I reading this report, I, I guess it's important that the viewers know um, if this agency, this organization closes in the middle of June, and if there's 15 families. What are they to do? I mean, are we creating, some, when I look at this report, they could be filled by this temporary shelters and you're only asking, getting 10 for now. Um, it wouldn't be enough. Through the chair. Um, I just want to um, assure council that the um, agencies who work with women in our uh, community are working very hard to ensure that the, it's now 14 women um, and um, that, that they are going to find housing. I, um, in a conversation that I just had with Catherine Kalinowski, um, who is the director of Good Shepherd and also the head of the Women's Homelessness Planning Collaborative, tomorrow all the various agencies who work with homeless women in our community, as well as honoring the circle, are getting together to case conference to go through each of the individuals and, and they are going to ensure that each of them are going to have housing by the uh, time that honoring the circle closes. So that's just a good example of how the agencies in Hamilton do work together well to ensure that the women in Hamilton are um, cared for as best as possible. And also the uh, women would not be returning to shelter. So um, Honoring the Circle is a transitional housing program. So generally, and this is only generally, women go to transitional housing after they've been in emergency shelter. And so I don't think that there are any plans, even though I might be wrong, that they would be returning to emergency shelter. The plan is that they would go into second stage housing or permanent housing with the supports that they require. Okay. Um, so thanks, Julian. So, uh, way I, I take in that, there is a, an idea, hoping that the plan works, that the organizations all are working together, um, and uh, decisions will have to be made, I guess, before middle of June, that was the deadline I heard. Um, but if it does fail, what happens? I mean, what, what can we do? We, we put them back into emergency shelters or... Um, as uh, Joanne just said to me, we can't let it fail. Okay. Um, certainly the emergency shelters are the backup if all else fails, but that certainly isn't the intention at this point in time. Okay, and then the other important question, Julian, is um, because Honoring the Circle, they have um, that kind of transitional housing has very many uh, support programs that helps these 
these individuals cope with some of the tragedies they've, they've been facing. Would those support programs still be there for them? Through the chair, yes, the support programs will still be there with the Homeward Bound, which is the Aboriginal Housing First program, as well as the um, Supporting Our Sisters, the SOS program. Both those programs work with women and children to assist them in finding permanent housing and pro providing them with the supports that they require to stay housed. Okay, and um, my last question is, <clears throat> honoring the circle, when you're calling the, for the applications, um, from November and that they could also apply into that program? Through the chair, are you referring to the call for applications that yes. we had last year? Um, Honouring the Circle did not apply for funding. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, Councillor Partridge to take the, uh, the chair for a moment. Yep, go ahead, please. I, um, I certainly support the report here before us. It's pretty clear that there's a need. Uh, you're locking in five, over time, five permanent, or ex I guess expanding five beds permanently at uh, Mary's place, and then uh, there'll be a tender that goes out for additional beds that's being recommended. And it's been clear uh, through the presentation earlier that I think we have another one coming, uh, that there's a need. I think the interesting piece uh, and, and more concerning piece, uh, not more concerning, because certainly uh, you need the shelters to deal with the, uh, the, emerg the uh, emergency situations of people that have no place to go. I guess the uh, concern I have though when we talk about um, um, the, the circle, uh, the transitional piece is I'm not clear on the need for transitional beds was pretty clear in the last 10, 15 years. That's why we established, and it was the funding established for the tra tra transitional piece to provide the services, get them uh, ready, and then shift them into permanent housing. Uh, that was identified as a housing strategy, you know, years, years past. Is that strategy, um, as a result of the funding commitment uh, shifting? Killian, I think uh, reiterate the answer for the federal government funding and the criteria change. Through the chair, <clears throat> there um, certainly the um, federal government through the homelessness partnering strategy, as well as the provincial government, um, has certainly shown support for the housing first model, which is rapid rehousing from emergency shelter into permanent housing without the transitional housing as that second step in there. But certainly what we've heard from the agencies that serve women, that there is a place, especially for women in transitional housing, uh, w single women and women with children seem to appreciate appreciate that opportunity to um, go into transitional housing first and then from there into permanent housing. Um, so I would say that certainly our funders um, have great support for housing first and that's why in part why we're going there but also the research as far as homelessness um, has certainly proven that the housing first model does indeed work. Councillor? Okay so can you help remind me for the purpose of, uh, of, of context, I guess, going back when uh, there wasn't transitional housing funded and there was an argument for creating uh, uh, funding for transitional housing, was it not a, a housing first strategy then? Joanne, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, in the past we actually, we did fund some transitional housing for women. It was called Somerville House and it was uh, through the Good Shepherd Centre. We actually were caught in a provincial audit in terms of we were using our per, di per diem funding for emergency shelters to fund the transitional ho housing, and we were told that we could not do that. That was for per diems and emergency shelters, so we had to end our funding uh, for Somerville House. That was a very difficult case for us and for the community um, because the province said, no, the money is not for, it's for per diems. So we had to end that funding. Uh, with the current funding that we get from the federal government, no, we cannot fund transitional housing. Um, with the money that we get from the province, our chippy money. Um, yes, the priority is housing first, but we have a little bit more discretion with that. But when we did our call for proposals, out of there came some of the funding that we do provide for the Y and for the SOS is what our contribution is towards transitional housing. The rest of it went into a variety of other programs, mainly with the intent, the priority of housing first. Okay, so I appreciate that. I think uh, uh, Councillor Green made the point. 
So philosophically, it doesn't appear that the provincial and federal government has as much um, appreciation for the transitional housing mo model or have shifted that priority to the housing first model um, and before they allowed the funding for those transitional housing. So I'm not sure what shifted um, from a policy perspective. And then again, the, the next question is, what is the city's position in regards to prioritizing transitional housing? Uh, does it still have a place in the current continuum? And if it does, then I guess the next question, what are we doing to talk to the federal and provincial partners uh, that their approach is short-sighted? Jillian, please. Through the chair, uh, the city of Hamilton does support transitional housing and that we are funding transitional housing for women. And also we support that concept for youth as well in, in some of our funding. Um, we have certainly been um, clear with the um, federal government that we did see a place for transitional housing in the funding, but it was their decision not to fund transitional housing. I appreciate it. My last question is, if in fact this could be the difference of uh, healing, the, what's it called, the healing circle? Honoring the circle, thank you. Um, if this could jeopardize um, the organization itself and the great work they've done for a number of years, do we have a strategy to sit down with that organization to sure, ensure that they continue being a player in this community and providing uh, uh, services? Do we have a strategy? Jillian, please. We don't have a strategy at this point in time, but uh, they are part of the Women's Homelessness Planning Collaborative. And so we're certainly working closely with the, the Women's Homelessness Planning Collaborative around planning for homelessness services for women. So they'll be a part, a part of that discussion. Uh, great. And there's some great representations on that collaborative. So thank you for that. Those are my questions. Mm -hmm. I'll take the chair back. I have no further speakers. So uh, back to you. Thank you. So we do have, uh, we have received, those are just questions of staff. We move to the next uh, delegation. And I had Deidre. I don't see Deidre. Oh, Deidre is here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Come on up, Deidre and Sarah. First, I want to apologize for my outburst there, Councillor Whitehead and Chair of this committee, about the SPCA earlier when you were introducing us, just because uh, I was very excited. You know, I often get introduced as Dirty Pike from the SPCA. And um, last week, a uh, cat came to the SPCA, SPRC, and we had to house the cat. So now I feel like we have fulfilled a mandate of both the SPRC and the SPCA. So I was quite excited when I thought you were maybe introducing me like Thank that. Thank you for that clarification. But that is not the important issue that uh, I'm here to talk about today. Housing cats is one thing, but housing women is another. And I'm the facilitator for the Women's Housing Planning Collaborative. Um, uh, for the next four years through the Homelessness Partnering Strategy. Uh, that's a commitment that the SPRC has, and my colleague Sarah Mayo and I will be providing support um, to this very important planning table uh, in Hamilton. And um, so you're having some very important uh, conversation here about uh, uh, transitional housing and, and uh, housing first and rapid housing and all things that... Um, uh, we've been taking a look at as a, as a systems planning table uh, since October when the city asked us to be um, leaders in, the, in a conversation. And, and so I want to acknowledge the people, at, you can see uh, the representation on the slide, but uh, in fact we have uh, today Laura Workman, the um, Associate uh, Executive Director from Honoring the Circle is here, uh, that, you know, who could be available to answer any questions you might have. We also have Christine uh, Filjazu from um, Good Shepherd, uh, the Director of Women's Services there. And of course, you've uh, heard from Adora already today, and Val Sadler is here for Mission Services, and other supportive members from the various agencies. So um, um, we are here to support the recommendations that have gone forward in, in, the, in this um, staff report that you're going to receive today. How could we not? Because many of them came from the report that SPRC uh, helped to pull together with the voices of the women on that collaborative. And so uh, a very... Um, uh, we're very much in agreement with with that, uh, but you know, again, since since that report came out, which it, it's in your uh, package, of course, it's the last bit in your package. Um, the uh, the news of the beds closing at uh, honoring the circle has become um, evident and has created more of a crisis situation, and uh, so we want to um, just be sure that. Uh, 
that you're aware of these, these issues, and it certainly sounds like you're considering them. Um, so our report asked for, um, you know, we were asked, what's the best solution? If these 10 emergency beds, these temporary beds are going to close, what's uh, the solution? And I want to also out myself as a neighbour to uh, Mary's place, um, well, it was in the paper today, and to say that, uh, you know, what an amazing asset Good Shepherd Women's Services is in our community for the women, for the um, for the neighbourhood. And um, But they also knew that those 10 beds were creating quite a... a pressure on the system and so um, we certainly think five beds is manageable there and support that uh, recommendation. Um, and so uh, the recommendations are there in, in your agenda that you can take a look at but we have some great data that supports that. Um, uh, the recommendations Sarah Mayo is uh, going to show you in a second about are the turnaways. You know the last time that WIPIC was here presenting uh, to you uh, there, we talked about 300 uh, turnaways in a month, um, and now it's gone up to 500 turnaways. So there's uh, something else that's really creating a lot of pressure on the system. Um, and you know, uh, recommendations around transitional housing, as Councillor Partridge uh, mentioned, are also in the WIPIC report. It's one of the key things to stay um, to to stay committed to supporting transitional housing, um, but also to find new supports for that. And, and clearly, it's become um, evident that uh, that that's important. So, really, I just want you to have a better understanding of how we've come to some of our conclusions. So, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, and I can be available for questions. But she knows more than me. Um, so quickly, this explains in large part why we're having a crisis in uh, women's emergency shelters uh, in Hamilton, the exponential um, increase in rents. This was presented to Council by staff last month, um, and also council sp uh, staff spoke to Council about uh, landlords being much more reticent, not willing to um, help out women in emergency situations, not willing to participate in housing allowances and uh, subsidy programs. And um, as we also heard, there's uh, long waiting lists, um, even when things go well um, with the um, with the administration of the access to housing wait list, the average wait time is actually about a year for people in emergency situations, including homeless people or people experiencing homelessness or uh, fleeing violence. In our report, uh, we looked at data. Um, we spoke to all the women's shelters looking at data for December 2014. And Mary's Place alone uh, turned away an average of 4.2 women every night in December 2014. And that stayed consistent uh, since then. I just spoke to them today and it's, it's pretty much the same in April. Um, in December 2014 on average, each individual woman uh, went and asked for shelter 2.8 times at Mary's Place um, who, who was turned away at, uh, in December. And these are uh, unique women. So we speak about turnaways in the hundreds, when we, um, but because women are, are asking multiple times, we also try to track how many individual women are we talking about. And so in December 2014, there were 46 individual women at Mary's Place. The highest was at Inasmuch House in Mission Services, where there were 64 individual women who were turned away in December 2014. So we know there's at least 64 women, um, and it could be higher because they're, um, we could be adding them up. They may not be going to all those um, different places and asking for shelter. So it could be 151. It could even be higher because um, some of the shelters don't track at the individual level because of privacy reasons. They don't want to um, ask women's name if they don't have a place for them to stay. Um, and we spoke to women uh, who were staying at the shelters and uh, asking them, what was it like to be refused shelter? Um, and women felt disheartened and inclined to give up. Another respondent elaborated, it's important to make sure that women can take the first step of getting into shelter and have a second step of housing after a shelter stay, otherwise you begin to give up. She went on to explain that she had seen many women turn to dangerous situations of sex work and or drug use in order to numb the feelings of rejection from shelter. 
So uh, our report lists some recommendations. Uh, the short-term recommendations have been discussed and some are in the uh, report today. Um, Medium-term recommendations in the re in, uh, from WIPIC include development and testing of a centralized bed use allocation uh, system, Exp um, the expansion of withdrawal support services, that's also in the recommendations from today in terms of asking the LINs for funding for that, provide interim housing options with supports, and long term, uh, longer term options, develop affordable housing stock that meets the unique needs of women, reorganize Hamilton's uh, domiciliary hostels system to provide better supportive housing f options for women, and develop robust community and peer to peer supports. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Sarah. I uh, have any questions of the presenter? Seeing none, I'm going to ask Councillor Green to take the. Go ahead, Councillor Green. Maybe, actually, maybe I should just move to receive because, or uh, wait for you because it is actually through to staff, but related to the presentation again. So my apologies, Mr. Chair. Yeah, actually, I'll, uh, all I was going to do is uh, uh, thank uh, Social Planning Research Council for doing all the great work they do in our community. Uh, uh, you are one of the strongest uh, backbones on social uh, uh, causes, and we need to recognize all the, the hard uh, and good efforts you've made on behalf of many of those that need you. Uh, so I, I just wanted to thank you for the presentation here today. So I will take the, uh, the chair back, and I move mo uh, motion to receive, moved by Councillor Green, second by Councillor Aiden Johnson. All those in favour? The opposed carried. Councillor Green, question of staff. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. It was brought up uh, the, the rising costs of rent. You know, we're having lots of conversations, Mr. Chair, around gentrification and what that looks like. One of my concerns, one of my very serious concerns, is I've had an increase in people uh, searching for homes. They've been, they're being displaced right now with 60 days notice using this imminent domain clause where people are, you know, real estate people are coming in, so-called investors, I say so-called, um, very sarcastically, that are displacing people under the guise of imminent domain, more so just to say that they're doing major renovations and then raise the price up. Mr. Chair, we have no way of knowing what happens after these folks are evicted. We have no way of tracking who these so-called investors are. Uh, and, and I know we had a conversation earlier, or at least in the past term, Mr. Chair, around licensing. Uh, but certainly, at this point in time, I have a very serious consideration for, at the very least, a registration, Mr. Chair. So I'm wondering through you, um, if there would be uh, a possibility, whether through a direction or a motion, to look at the feasibility of a landlord registration, Mr. Chair, because I'm seeing this gentrification happen in Ward 3 faster than anybody can keep control of, and uh, quite frankly, I, I really challenge the legitimacy of all these so-called imminent domains on the triplexes and duplexes. So it's a very serious, serious problem, one that we don't have an answer for and has a lot of complexity, but it doesn't mean that we shy away from it, Mr. Chair. So I'm wondering uh, when at the appropriate time I can move a motion to begin to look at the feasibility for a landlord registration. Thank you. Um, uh, any comments from clerks? Clerks, sorry, staff. Through the chair. <clears throat> Uh, planning and economic development is looking into that uh, possibility and um, I know that I've had several conversations with them so we are looking at doing a joint report on that topic. So, so I, Mr. Chair, as, as much as I love planning and act dev, this is very much a community emergency services issue I believe uh, and, and I will consider this a notice of motion as I get some things fleshed out. There's, there's something that I know we have to look at with planning uh, section 19 and what that looks like and, and uh, so I, I will consider this a notice, a notice of motion for something coming down the line. I appreciate it and uh, for clarification there is a rental uh, uh, committee, right? I believe it's called, is that what license, rental licensing committee? It, can you, do you Through the chair the there is a standards, a property standards committee, would that no, be no, what you're referring no, no. to? No, no, no. There's a there's one there's a committee with landlords and, and councillors looking at the whole issue of uh, of um, substandard rental units in our community. It emanated from uh, the discussion on licensing rental units. 
so there is a committee struck, and I've got to think that this would fall under that purview as well, because they're going to be looking at the whole array of uh, legislative and regulatory tour tools they might u utilize on a go-forward basis. So it's certainly timing to, to open that discussion and, and turn up the heat. So then, Mr. Chair, through you to the clerks, so maybe I'll, I'll be asking that we convene that subcommittee. I know you're on it, I'm on it, as well as some uh, residents who have been selected through the selection process. But I just wanted to make note the, the, the slide that was raised, Mr. Chair, uh, the high costs. There is this, you know, this condoization of apartments, which is eroding affordable housing, and there's this idea of imminent domain, which, quite frankly, after people are displaced, I don't think, I don't think there's a... a um, I don't think that there's an, an intention for people once you're kicked out to revisit, find out did the family really move in and if they did, what does that mean? So I, that, that is one crack in our system that I would certainly like to fill and, and I appreciate you referring it to uh, the Rental Licensing Committee of which we're both on and I look forward to having that conversation there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Aidan Johnson. Thanks very much, and I'd like to echo the thanks to Deirdre and Sarah for the outstanding presentation and rich information we received today. I don't want to get the conversation too off track, uh, but I'd like to thank Councillor Green for bringing up what I think is a very vital uh, policy move that we need to be pursuing in the city. Um, something that's sort of unique about the rental housing portfolio is that it, it involves both low-income families as well as at-risk students in the McMaster and Mohawk communities. Uh, I believe it's myself, Councillor Whitehead, and, and Councillor Green, who are the council reps on uh, the Rental Housing Committee. And the reason I think that's a good thing is that it represents a possibility of the very at-risk, low-income uh, families and communities in Ward 3 having conversation and joining forces with the Mohawk neighbours and the McMaster neighbours and hopefully with the student communities to create policies that work for everybody. So I think it's that kind of multi-community conversation that uh, represents probably our best hope for making some good progress on this. So many thanks to Councillor Green. I'm looking forward to moving forward with that. Cheers. Thank you. I'm going to ask, ask, ask Councillor Green to take the chair for a moment. Uh, there was, a, in part of the presentation, a number of recommendations from the Social Planning Research Council that aren't uh, reflected in this report. Uh, can I just ask, uh, what is the status of those recommendations? Have we taken positions? Are we still uh, uh, pondering those recommendations? Through the chair, we are going to be pondering those recommendations and working with the Women's Homelessness Planning Collaborative as far as the feasibility and implementation of them. And we are going to be bringing a report forward to Council in September 2016, not only on those recommendations, but on the status of the emergency shelter system given the additional beds and mobile uh, case management. Great. I just want to make sure that the, uh, the recommendations that are not caught in this report are still part of the uh, overall dialogue and discussion. So that, those are my questions. I'll take the chair back. Councillor Partridge. Yes. Th <clears throat> yes. Thank you. And um, just to follow up on that, that report, did you say is coming in September 2016? That is correct. Okay. September 2016. Okay. So I, it just, it, just so that we don't lose um, the recommendations that were made in that social planning and research document, I'm wondering if that could be an appendix to that report, just so that we've got it there uh, for context. Through the chair, uh, we can certainly do that. Okay, thank you very much. Councilor Green. Forgive me, Mr. Chair, I'm just curious, why, why a year and a half for the report? the chair we were thinking in terms of a year and a half because we're doing the call for applications so we won't actually be adding the 15 additional beds to the emergency shelter system until probably December and so we figure um, we would have that period of time um, almost a year to assess the impact of having the additional beds in the system as well as the additional case management and that would also give us a good opportunity to really work on the recommendations so that we can have a good um, report going forward. Thank you Mr. Chair that makes makes pretty good sense to me. Thank you. So at this point, uh, lots of good discussion. We do have the original report, which we sort of deviated from, and that is the uh, eight point, well, no, that was delegation. Sorry, we're not at 8.1 yet. Thank you. Actually, we are now at um, presentation 7.1, and Councillor Marilla has arrived just in time. I uh, 
call project manager McQuestion Urban Farm, respecting McQuestion Urban Farm design and construction. Actually, could I, before you come up, before we come up, just for a matter of uh, uh, routine, we had a lot of discussion. We have the delegates, delegations here. Can we just sort of move up uh, 8.1 uh, and deal with that so we can uh, uh, have the individuals here to hear any discussion if there's any? So uh, hold on, don't go away for the, 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 uh, the big question, but I'm gonna look at my colleagues to see, I did a motion to move 8.1 up. Moved by Councilor Marilla, second by Councilor Green. All those in favor? Carry. Any opposed, carry. 8.1, is there any discussions on the report? Uh, item 8 point, pressure and emergency shelter serving single women's uh, homeless women. Moved by Councilor Marilla, second by Councilor Deval. All those in favor? Carry. Any opposed, carry. Thank you very much. Now, th thank you, it's fully uh, endorsed. Now we move to, uh, uh, to the big question. Urban Farm respecting, uh, Urban Farm does design and construction in Ward 4. I believe it's Mr. Adam Watson. And I'm gonna ask, ask Councilor Green, can I get you to take the chair for, momentarily? Mr. Watson, yes. you might want to just, oh, okay. Oh, uh, yes. I know it's a little bit of a stretch. It's not a very well-placed <laughs> microphone. All right. Great. Can you hear me? Oh, great. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the Emergency and Community Services Committee. I'm Adam Watson, uh, Project Manager with the McQuestion Urban Farm Project with the Neighborhood Action Strategy. And with me today is Pat Reed, resident of McQuestion, well-known, and a uh, uh, member of the McQuestion Community Planning Team, as well as the McQuestion urban farm subcommittee. So we'll be presenting the design of the farm proposed today and uh, look forward to any conversation we have. Pat, go ahead. Thank you. Welcome everybody. I'm, first of all, if you're not aware of where McQuestan is, McQuestan neighborhood is in the east end of Hamilton and Sam Morella's uh, ward. Uh, it's the southern boundary is Queenston Road, the west boundary is Parkdale, the east boundary is Red Hill Valley, and the north is the railway tracks north of Barton, so that's our neighborhood. In, and <clears throat> interesting, in our neighborhood, we have a great deal of difficulty for access to fresh food. Um, the closest store is approximately two kilometers from anyone in. We also have a problem of people not having access to vehicles or to, um, or have mobility issues as well. Many of our residents are, live on an, in Ontario Works or Ontario Disability with a large number of single parents. And as you can imagine, a single parent takes their children to get groceries out by bus and to come home they have to take a taxi. So this becomes an added cost to the groceries that they get. Interesting, in our neighborhood, as you can see the banner over here, up top there's a 7-Eleven. It is the most profitable 7-Eleven in Hamilton. <laughs> that is because there's no access to other food. The urban farm project is a dream of the McQuiston residents and it's utilizing three acres of land that has been lying dormant for 60 years. Uh, the neighborhood would like to increase food security, pro provide food education and skill building, as well as job skills training and options for social enterprise. The McQuiston Neighborhood Action Plan, which was approved by Council in 2012, and the development of the urban farm is one of the key actions in this plan. <clears throat> Goal C is to enhance the community health and well-being, and part of that objective one is to ensure food security for the neighborhood. Other two goals that it does achieve is strengthening economic development and investments. And the th goal D is to strengthen neighborhood pride and promote neighborhood beautification. Adam? Thank you, Pat. 
Pictured here is the proposed urban farm site outlined in yellow. It's uh, Melvin Avenue and Woodward Avenue are to the north. Hillcrest Park and the Red Hill Valley are to the east, and St. Helens Centre and Oriel Crescent are to the west. After the Neighbourhood Action Plan was, uh, was approved, staff began working with the planning team to develop uh, a plan for the creation of the urban farm. The McQuiston Urban Farm Committee was formed and has been meeting regularly for the past two years to develop the neighbourhood's vision for the farm. Committee members include neighbourhood residents, service providers, the community developer, and city staff from community services, public health, and public works. One of the major products of what we've produced from that was the, was the vision, was the banner here, done through a facilitated workshop, which outlined all of the um, neighbourhood residents' visions for what they would like to see included in the urban farm. An urban agriculture review was also completed by researchers at the University of Toronto to determine opportunities and barriers in place for urban agriculture in Hamilton. Planning restrictions were identified and staff have, been, have made the necessary amendments to the official plan, which were approved by Council in fall of 2014, to allow for urban agriculture to take place in the city. A Phase 1 and Phase 2 environmental site assessment was completed for the site throughout 2014 to determine the presence of, of any soil contamination. Fortunately, the soil sampling results came back clean, with only a couple of small areas of concern that we have been able to mitigate through the design process. The first stage of farm development was the partnership with the Hamilton Victory Gardens in 2014. The northern section of the farm site was licensed to Hamilton Victory Gardens with the goal of starting to produce fresh food for the neighbourhood and to start resident activity on the site. There are now over 140 raised beds on the site producing food for the neighbourhood and local food banks, as well as community garden beds to give residents a place to grow their own food. In the fall of 2014, the neighbourhood's office put forward a, uh, brought forward a, a temporary project manager to take the initial groundwork of the, uh, that we've completed and move forward with the McQuiston Farm Committee on the design and construction of the urban farm. A stakeholder committee was formed in February 2015 to work with a design consultant to, to take the neighbourhood vision for the farm as illustrated in the banner, as well as take the site topography and the soil assessment results and complete a full conceptual design of the urban farm, which we are excited to present to you today. Bean and Stock Design and Consulting was selected as the designer due to their extensive experience in working closely with residents and community-based organizations to design functional, innovative, and beautiful green spaces. Here is an aerial view of the farm site displaying the full community vision for the McQuestion Urban Farm. In the northern section, which is on the left, up at Melvin, uh, the raised beds are already constructed by Hamilton Victory Gardens. South of this is where we intend to move forward with the proposed construction activities. First, we propose to grade the site and create the farm fields in the middle and southern portions of the site. Configure the site drainage and install the required pathways and surfacing. Trees will be planted for shade and windbreak to make the space enjoyable for visitors, and fruit trees will be planted throughout the site, particularly in the middle section. Perennial plants and shrubs will be planted mostly along the eastern edge of the site to provide pollinator habitat, as well as food and medicinal plants, and also to provide some visual separation from the adjacent neighbours. This corridor of planting we are proposing as a native plant walk, which will showcase many of the food and medicinal plants traditionally used by the Aboriginal people who lived around the Red Hill Valley. And it will link in well with the extensive ecological restoration work that was done as part of the Red Hill Valley Parkway. Entrance features at the main pedestrian accesses to the site are also planned. Wherever possible, we are planning to incorporate a community build process into these construction activities, where residents are involved hands-on with the construction. This is done to build community ownership of the farm and to offer education and job skills development to neighbourhood residents. So moving into some of the specific design features, as the urban farm will serve as a place to host food education workshops and school group tours from across the city, an accessible community gathering space and outdoor amphitheatre with a covered area is planned for the middle of the site. This middle area of the site is highly trafficked with uh, students and community residents, so we would like to keep that open and accessible. Just south of the raised beds is the low point of the site, which is, results in an area of flooding and standing water for a significant period of the year. 
As the site doesn't currently have a connection to the municipal water supply, we would propose to turn this liability into a resource and construct a pond that collects rainwater and feeds the irrigation system. The irrigation system will be powered by a small wind turbine and will and eliminate a significant annual operating cost for the farm, while demonstrating an innovative environmental solution to visitors at the site. At the south end of the site, we propose to construct a service vehicle access and a secure storage area for farm equipment and tools. We are very thankful to our partners at City Housing Hamilton for allowing us to utilize their existing driveway and maintenance building at Oriole Crescent to achieve some significant cost savings. At the south end of the site is where we propose to construct a covered area with shade sails and picnic tables to install the wind, to install the wind turbine to power the irrigation system. In order to complete the construction works described, staff is requesting permission to undertake a competitive procurement process at an estimated cost of $350,000 to be funded from the Neighbourhood Action Strategy. This area, as you can see, also includes uh, different um, features such as an enclosed food preparation area, a teaching greenhouse and a larger production greenhouse. But these are not planned to be funded through the Neighbourhood's office and they are not required in order for us to begin farm operations in the spring. All of these amenities will allow for the farm to increase the amount of food produced on the site and provide more options for food education, job skills training and social enterprise at the urban farm. We are actively pursuing sponsorships, donations and grants to fund these amenities and we have an interest from some, some significant donors which we plan to report back on as part of the farm's operating and business plan later in 2015. This project has already been successful in securing grants and donations of over $70,000, which has allowed us to hire a community animator for a year to promote community engagement at the site and coordinate activities at the Victory Gardens. We've also been able to receive funding to fund a, a food and gardening camp for 120 neighborhood children this summer. So thank you very much. We will be showing a quick video of the animation of the farm design and Pat will have a few closing remarks. The McQuiston Urban Farm will serve as a pilot project for urban agriculture in Hamilton and serve as a model for other food projects in other neighborhoods. The McQuiston Urban Farm will be big enough to offer fresh produce and help build food skills to residents of other neighbourhoods. We're hoping that the other neighbourhood action strategies will be, become participatory in this process. We have communicated with them as well. And it will offer educational opportunities to residents and school groups from across the city. The farm, in combination with the planned recreation trail next to the site will make McQuiston a destination for people from across the city and improve the health of our residents. Thank you. Excellent, excellent presentation to both Pat and, uh, and Adam. Fantastic. We have the Ward Councillor, Councillor Sam Rula, first up. Uh, let me just uh, start off, Mr. Uh, Chairman, by, uh, by thanking both Adam and Pat for the presentation. I really don't have any questions. I do want to speak uh, about the item itself, so I'll move that uh, we receive the presentation if there aren't any other questions from other uh, members. We do have Councillor Partridge who, uh, who may have some... Uh, Fair enough, so I'll, I'll, I'll move it accordingly, seconded by Councillor Partridge, and then she... Councillor Partridge, did you have any questions for the presentation or would you like to receive it and then speak to it? Uh, well, no, as seconder to the motion, I sure. would like to speak to it though. Okay. Okay. Um, I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, you know, being the ward councillor for Ward 15 in Flamborough, of which 70% is, uh, is rural uh, and farm country and growing up in farm country myself, I, I love that component of having the children's um, participation as part of that. And as you know, I think a lot of people probably recognize that there are a number of farms out in Flamborough that uh, have children from the city come out and do tours of the farms. And, um, you know, I, I just, it, having grown up that way, I can't imagine anyone not ever being to a farm and not knowing where eggs come from and, you know, where, uh, where the farm animals and the crops and everything else that happens on it. But I particularly like, uh, through you, Chair, I particularly like the addition of the windmill. 
that is going to be there. And, um, and, I'm, and I'm just wondering, can you just expand a little bit on the irrigation system and how that will work? I'm assuming there's going to be a pond, a natural pond? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, through the chair. Um, so this slide here, maybe I'll quickly go to it. This here is the low point on the site. Um, which already floods for probably a good three or four months of the year. We call it Lake McQuestan. Uh, it's, so because there's already standing water there and most of the site uh, has a clay base underneath it, quite a thick one, we propose to excavate this out and flow all the water onto the, that right lands on the site, the incident rainfall, down into this pond structure here. So it will be an enclosed pond space which will have a connection to a pumping system which would be powered by the windmill. All right, thank you very much for that. Anyone who has uh, you know, worked on a farm or who has a farm will tell you that you always irrigate your crops by the natural rain and the water um, through a pond or, or some sort of an irrigation system that is not connected to your well. And in this case, we would not want city water to be watering our crops uh, with the additional you know, chemicals and, and uh, that's just not what farming is about. So even on, on real farms, and you know, this is an urban farm, which I'm a huge supporter of urban farms, and I just congratulate you so much for doing this. We need to do this in other areas of the city, um, you know, particularly down uh, down by the waterfront in the east end. I just I just think it's ripe down there to do this kind of thing. So thank you very much, and I'm I'm, I'm very honored to second it. My apologies, Councillor Marula, for inversing the order. Uh, feel free to speak on the motion if you'd like, or would you like to? I just received it, so perhaps you can have their seat now. Yes, okay, we have a motion to receive the presentation. All those in favor, carried. And now on the... On and thank you both, Adam and Pat, for your wonderful presentation and all the wonderful work that you've done leading up to today. And on the item, we have Councillor Marula. Yes, thanks, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. And again, I want to thank uh, Adam and Pat and the neighbourhood... Uh, the neighborhood for, for their involvement and, and Suzanne Brown and, and her staff um, in really executing what I think is a plan that's not only entrepreneurial in, in, um, in its foundation, but also it's a social enterprise. And you look at all of the various uh, aspects of what's before us, and it really, is, what's old is, is new again uh, in many ways, and I know I say this quite often, it's quite remarkable how eating local, which years ago, when my parents as immigrants came over, everyone had a garden and and uh, everyone recycled and everyone reused and everyone basically lived in a manner conducive to um, being very socially conscious, but also very environmentally cautious and conscious. And, and looking at all of the successes today and looking at what's what's new, which was old, it's quite remarkable how now the hipsters have taken ownership of something that is, 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 is really archaic in many ways. So, but I'm glad that we are moving in this direction because it is sustainable. And the way with urban sprawl and, and, and other aspects of lack of uh, intensification, we were headed towards an unsustainable type of um, scenario. And you look at this project, you look at the sweat equity component, you look at the fact that St. Helens Community Center, um, and, and I have to give um, congratulations to the, the Catholic School Board, who rather than closing and selling the school to the same taxpayers that already paid for that school, they've actually, they've actually um, made it into a very active community hub that is, that is very tangible in all of the services they provide. So to them, I say congratulations and thank you. I also must thank um, Pat Reed as uh, one of the presenters here today with her passion uh, in that community and ensuring that, uh, that St. Helens and, and all of the aspects of St. Helens is active and, and, and very robust for the community. The question is a neighborhood that has come a long way. I know that Pat, who also sits on, on our housing, um, Hamilton Housing Committee, or board also uh, recognizes that we've come a long way in the sense that we've diversified the tenants at the Oreo Crescent. And we went from everyone basically being uh, low income, uh, where we in essence ghettoized an area, to it being mixed income now. And as a direct result, we've seen some very tangible outcomes come from that. In that, uh, we've seen people actually coming in and actually purchasing homes. Uh, we've seen a, a renaissance in that particular area. With the, 
with the redevelopment of Lowell's. And although and a redevelopment of Lowell's, we've had the bike the trail, the pedestrian bridge, which is not too far from there, a new, a new elementary school. Um, so we have property values increasing by three, four hundred percent. Things are going well. But in all of that, we still have a segment of the population that truly um, are in need. And this particular project, in essence, provides an opportunity to not only allow those that are in need to access what was, I guess, perceived as a vegetable and fruit desert, uh, but also have them involved through sweat equity and empowerment in the process to ensure that it's not really a hand out, but a hand up. And I think that's where the distinction is uh, when it comes to these types of projects. And I, I, have, to, uh, I have to applaud also the neighboring community, uh, particularly those that are volunteering um, and also those that are participating in, in the actual activities there. So uh, lastly, uh, all I basically say is that when you're looking at um, some sort of project, this is a model that's, as I mentioned, a social enterprise with an entrepreneurial flair that um, is really a model that all other neighborhoods in this, in this community should be aspiring to see come to fruition. And I, I, I proudly move it and passionately move it, seconded by uh, Councillor Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Green. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, I think, Mr. Chair, what's most interesting about this for me personally is that in 2010, I actually had the privilege of doing a walkthrough McQuest with the Hamilton Community Foundation as a board member. And I think at that time, it might have been uh, David Derbyshire uh, toing the tour. And, and what, what strikes me, I think, most um, is that walking through that, it was certainly a humble garden at that time, and I, I can even in fact remember back to 2006 when they did the Extreme Park makeover. So watching this community kind of emerge, um, and, then, and then of course here at Council seeing this strategy come to, its, uh, come to its, its, its completion, or at least the beginning of its completion, for me is really special because I think it speaks to the work of the Neighborhood Action Strategies. I would, I would guess this is probably the biggest, the largest infrastructure project uh, that has been that has been really designed and led and, um, and supported by the residents, which I think is not just a testament to, to Ward 4 and the leadership that's there, but really what is, they're, they're showing the rest of the city, Mr. Chair, and all the other hubs, what is possible if you think big, because this is a community, a neighborhood transformation in the taking. We're seeing it now, and I can only imagine in a year or two when it's complete and we're all getting strawberries, uh, from the farmer's field there. Um, Councilor Marula, is that a condition on the, uh, that, that we'll, we'll look back at today and think about, you know, a humble garden, Mr. Chair, that turned into an action strategy that became a neighborhood shared vision, now truly supported by the city. And it is, and I do say that, because, you know, it's one thing to have the action strategies out there, but if we're not funding them, if we're not empowering people to make these kind of huge transformations in their community, it's really just, uh, it's, it's all policy. So I am so excited to see this over the last, uh, well, since 2010, over the last five years. And uh, it's a testament to, to Paul Johnson, uh, to you, Suzanne, and, and to your entire staff, um, Adam, and, and, and all the residents that are there. I'm looking forward to, uh, to joining you um, on the, on the celebratory opening harvest. I'll bring my, my galoshes and, and maybe uh, do some work myself. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor Green. I'll ask Councilor Green to take the chair. I, um, at Gen Review, uh, um, had to get clarification. I thought it was uh, happening in, uh, although I said Ward 4, uh, I thought they had the name mixed up because there's McQuestion Park in Ward 7. So uh, after that clarification, uh, uh, it made a whole heck of a lot of sense in regards to uh, the, the proposal here before us. The, um, the other thing is uh, I know that um, there was a pretty significant uh, gardens at uh, Highland Baptist Church Victory Gardens with Mr. Dave Wilcox uh, produced, I don't know how many pounds of, uh, of food. Um, so I would hope that uh, as we go down this uh, great, exciting um, initiative that we, um, we got Rolston that's on our, our, our radar in regards to neighborhood uh, development and I, I understand the nature and the demographics of Rolston. Uh, I can't wait to see something like this happen there as well. So well done, Councillor uh, Marula, well done staff, well, well done neighborhood uh, for uh, this initiative. I'll take the chair back. You can't have it, no, I'm kidding. <laughs>
So uh, it was duly moved and seconded. All those in favor? Carried. Any opposed? Carried. So we're uh, now at uh, 8.2. Is there any questions and discussions with respect to the item 8.2, purchase of new stretchers and loading systems? Councillor Jackson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm supportive of this, but I just got three quick questions through you to Chief Sanderson. Uh, Chief, during the 2015 budget, both capital and operating, I think I was one of the ones just, just consistently asking, look, um, you know, is this your ask uh, for this year? Is the extra ambulances, the extra impact on the operating? And so I just don't remember uh, the need for the new stretchers, unless my memory failed me. I don't recall new need for new stretchers coming out. Mr. Chairman, through you to the Chief, possibly for a comment, please. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we did not uh, go over the new stretchers last year during the Council budget presentation times. We were in the process of doing an evaluation with staff with respect to the stretchers, and our focus had been based upon ensuring that we could do this within a cost recovery basis in, in terms of the capital cost. So it was not considered at the 2015 capital process time. We did not review it at that time. Uh, it was based upon staff evaluation. Uh, the actual review by staff ended in December. Uh, we, we finished our review of it at that point in time and we created the report following that. Okay, thanks Chief for that explanation. Um, so sourcing it to um, a striker power or with role in emergency, can you just explain, are they the only um, game in town, Mr. Chairman, through you to Chief? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. The um, striker stretchers are marketed in Ontario through a single vendor. Uh, that he has uh, the entire market in Ontario. Uh, the only options for purchasing that particular device is through striker directly or through their vendor uh, in Ontario, which is Roland uh, Products. Uh, the actual price from them is exactly the same, and uh, the installation will be being done by Roland as a marketed, uh, as a capable distributor and installer in Ontario. My only... Um Concern, Chief, um, with the sole source in something like this, and I raise it with uh, when we buy new buses and things like that. I just want to make sure uh, we're not held hostage at the time that the uh, these um, these stretchers, if approved today, um, after what it's a six to eight year life expectancy. If I read the information report correctly, I just want to make sure we're not held hostage, which could potentially cost taxpayers more money if there's only one supplier out there and we're beholden to them. Mr. Chairman, through you to the Chief. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I share that same concern. Uh, when we end up looking at devices as we move forward, uh, we have to look at it and make sure that we have the best competitive price that we can. I can tell you that when we looked out of province in terms of the actual power load aspect of the device, uh, the striker power load that goes into the vehicle, uh, we actually contacted our vendor of record, uh, Demers, uh, which is based out of uh, Montreal, Quebec, to look at their product and, and they could actually introduce it and put it into our vehicle. The price was significantly higher coming from them. So uh, we do share that concern. We will be looking at that on an ongoing basis. Uh, but it is, I think, in, in the best interest to have consistency and uh, stability in the platform. Thanks for taking that under advisement, Chief, and acknowledging the um, mutual concern there. And lastly, the C part. Now, I guess I've been around a few years to see where this payback type thing, mm -hmm. and with best of intentions, and I've been around long enough to see where after a few years that particular department heads come back to council and gone, you know what, we were hoping to have this paid back, but the, the savings didn't quite result, Mr. Chairman, the way we were hoping they were, they would, and council usually, and I've been part of that, ends up saying, well, good experiment, I'm sorry that, well, we didn't get the savings we were hoping for, and that may be a lesson learned type of thing. So, Chief, are you going to keep a close eye on this, Mr. Chairman, through the Chief, please. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, not only am I going to be keeping a close eye on that, I know that the general manager and the finance folks will be keeping a very close eye on it. We've gone over the numbers extensively, and that certainly took some time period to go through it, looking at the actual WSIB costs, looking at the frequency for modified duty, duty to accommodate, uh, looking at the types of injuries and comparing ourselves with other jurisdictions. So we are very comfortable with our projection, and in fact, I think our projection may be conservative. We may have the option for actually preserving some further capital down the road 
road, uh, and I'm going to hold that one in, in mind as we look at it, uh, and that's in particular for what we refer to as the bariatric units. Uh, for very large patients, those patients in excess of 550 pounds. Uh, so we, we may not require specialized vehicles for those patients moving forward on these, and that would save us some capital into the future as well. So we are very confident. Uh, we understand your concern and we share that, and I know that we're going to be held accountable for it. Chief, all the answers, Mr. Chairman, you've given have raised my comfort level enormously. Of course, this is first and foremost for the protection of our frontline paramedics, over 200, 250 of them, as well as for the patients that they so capably look after. So um, I'm very happy with the answers I've been given, Mr. Chairman, and can support 8.2 at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Doyle. Yeah, just a question, Mr. Chairman, um, to the Chief. Chief, um, if for the single source uh, with rolling emergency vehicles, uh, this product is made in Canada, like we're not going offshore? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the product is made in the United States. Uh, it's not a Canadian-made product that's made only in one place in the world, uh, that is in the U.S. It's imported into Canada and Roland is the distributor for Ontario. American-made product, we can't get it nowhere in Canada? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, there is no product made in Canada of an equivalent okay. nature. Okay. Thank you. I think I ask uh, Councillor Green to take the chair. I, um, I know on agenda review we had the discussion, and I, I said to the chief, I mean, I, I had this discussion with Joanne this morning, that anyone uh, could be a good leader if they got all the money in the world. But a, a good leader uh, is an individual that uh, works within the, the financial constraints that are provided. Having said that, we know uh, the transition that's taken place in uh, the paramedic community. We were passed a lemon uh, from the province of Ontario relative to uh, what was being funded and the amount of uh, paramedics relative to the, uh, uh, the service in our community. Uh, so it's taken a number of years um, to build a solid foundation. And we know that if you don't have a solid foundation, um, you're going to have uh, not only a poor service, of course, you're going to have a lot of your frontline workers, uh, whether it's WSIB or, or absenteeism, uh, and, uh, and it actually costs you more money with less service. So you need to have a solid foundation. So I guess my question to the chief, uh, through the, 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 uh, the chair, is with all the changes we've made, with the financial commitment and all the staffing uh, commitments we've made, with a commitment, uh, rightly so, uh, for these stretchers, do you feel we have a solid foundation to work from now? Uh, Mr. Chair, in response to that, I, yes, I do believe we have a solid foundation to work from. Uh, we've got the staffing put in place and approved by council that would move us forward. Uh, we have adequate capital in terms of our vehicles. You, you've set us up well in terms of our vehicles going to the next several years. Uh, this ends up changing it, and I look at these stretchers in terms of how we look after our staff and the process on it. I look at these stretchers and these devices as game changers. We're looking at a technology now to replace a technology that was new in the 1990s. Uh, and in the 1990s, it was a move forward from what we had in the 1970s and 80s. This changes the game for our paramedics, it changes the game for the future, and it changes the game for our city. So I, I'm quite confident in this platform moving forward. And I should mention that um, the chief uh, took time out of his busy schedule because uh, uh, logistics didn't work quite right for the, uh, the agenda review. It came from Toronto all the way from Toronto to, uh, to sit down and, and talk to me about this report and showed me a clip of the actual uh, device uh, in operation. So I, uh, I want to thank the Chief for uh, educating me and uh, giving me the opportunity to ask the tough questions and appreciate what he's trying to achieve, what his vision is, and certainly I see the representative of the union, uh, and I can tell you that uh, if you provide the right equipment to, uh, to your workers, you uh, not only will get a sense of pride, but you certainly get uh, a more productivity. So thank you very much for the report. I'll take the chair back. And is there any further questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Carried. Any against? Carried. Thank you. So motions, are there any motions? I see none. Knows the motion, seeing none. General information, I could now call on Joanne Priel to provide a verbal update respecting Ontario Works social assistance management system. Sam's. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Uh, June the 22nd, we're going to come back with a full report in terms of the uh, where we're at with SAMS and the uh, cost in terms of the uh, transition. 
uh, you'll know that the uh, province did uh, contract with PricewaterhouseCoopers to do a report on the transition uh, on SAMS. It was very clear in that report that they never looked at the SAM system, they just looked at the uh, transition. Uh, but I can tell you in the report which I have here, there was four comments in terms of uh, transition positives and there was four and a half pages in terms of transition challenges. Um, just so that you know, we have had to reallocate 43 of our staff to working uh, on the case management uh, part, uh, with case managers to increase our case manager complement because we were dealing with a caseload of 153 to 1, which is absolutely unmanageable. Um, we moved uh, several of our employment staff, our employment verification staff, and a team that we had to provide coverage. Uh, that caused a lot of angst with our staff. We have to move people. Uh, we've created two additional case management teams. That's going to cost us uh, money. Um, and we've created a team to provide some oversight of business transformation team. Um, so to sum it up, um, here is the transition plan that the province has. Um, you'll see that it goes from March the 31st of 2015 to March the 31st of 2016. And I can tell you that in my uh, and my impression is that the bars end at 2016, not because the work is done, but by, because that's the end of their fiscal year. Um, I was at a meeting with my 47 other colleagues recently. Jillian was there with me on May the 5th. Um, I can tell you that everybody, although you may hear conflicting messages, uh, we were able to confirm that everybody is in the same situation as we are. Um, we have now managed the chaos, so we're not in their uh, emergency management sort of structure anymore. We've moved into a business transformation team oversight, um, but it'll be at least a year, I think, in terms of those staff that have been reallocated to try and bring some, uh, so that our case management function returns to it being whole, because right now what we're focused on is just making sure we take applications and that the checks get out. We're not making uh, referrals to employment services. We're not making referrals to helping hands. We're not doing our employee employment, very, we're not doing a lot of things um, in terms of our case management function. So. Um, as I said, it continues to be stressful for staff. All I can say is that we've managed the chaos. It's not that things have necessarily gotten any better. Thank you. Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And through you to Joanne. Um, I, I mean, Joanne, I'm, I'm stunned. And, and, I'm, and I'm sure that um, all of you are as well. Um, I have uh, had a few of the staff that we've reallocated uh, contact me. Um, and this is, you know, this is devastating for, for everybody. So anything we can do to help with the process. But my question through you, Chair, at, at who is going to pay for this? I mean, at one point there was some discussion from the province that there were, uh, you know, monies coming forward or they had put some money forward already. But now we're talking about an entire year up to, I think you said, March 2016. And then uh, it, it, it ends because the program ends, but I don't see that the challenges are going to end. So um, can, you, can you just give us any kind of feedback around the funding portion of it and what happens after that 2016 deadline, if you know? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, so so far the province um, has given us a little over 500 some odd thousand dollars towards the cost of implementation of the system. Uh, the report that we're going to bring forward at, on the June 22nd meeting will clearly identify the costs that we think Good. that the SAMS has, uh, is costing us and will cost us for the remainder of this year. Um, and and I, I don't want to hazard a guess right now, Councillor Partridge, but it's going to be significantly more than $500,000. Yeah. Um, and uh, I did meet with the uh, mayor and briefed him because he was anticipating a call from the minister. Um, and so that's one of the points and key messages that I gave to the mayor um, was that the province, when I, we were at, Julie and I were at the meeting, acknowledged that this transition plan was going to require them to make significant investments in their own uh, staffing and transitional processes. So the point that I made and that I continue to make is that we have the same costs and, and issues in terms of our transition locally as well. Yes, thank you for that, Joanne. And of course, you know, we are one of 444 municipalities province-wide, all of which are being put onto this, or are now on this new system is my understanding. I'll wait till the uh, June 22nd, but I look forward to that report coming back, particularly on the cost. Thank you. Thank you, and I just uh, uh, wanted to thank uh, Council uh, Samarillo, who when I came in this morning, uh, wished me a happy birthday, although it's a bit premature, it's actually tomorrow. 
But having said that, the reason why I'm highlighting it, because uh, coincidentally the Canada Post hearing is at two o'clock tomorrow. So you know what my wish is. Anyway, uh, we have outstanding business list. I need a motion, the outstanding business list as outlined in item 11, 2, A, B, and C. Moved by Councillor Partridge, second by Councillor Deval. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. I need a motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Brulla, second by Councillor Aidan Johnson. All those in favor? Carried.